Hello everybody, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner. This is part of my Theory of Python video series and this is a video that's really aimed for people that are new to computers in general. And I know that some of you might be programming for a while and this may be a lot of review for you, but I think there's some information here that's important that if you've missed somehow that you need to, you need to be aware of. Also, if you're new to computers, You've just heard of these things called computers. You think you might want to be a programmer. I talked about what programmers do in a previous video. I talked about um, you know, different things on different videos. This, this will help you understand what a computer actually is. And so what we're going to do is we're not going to actually describe a real computer because real computers are extremely complex. They are ridiculously complex. However, what we're going to do is we're going to build a model. And a model is an abstraction. It's, it basically has features that will give you a good idea of what's actually happening inside of a computer to help you make good decisions when you write your program. But a lot of the things in this model are just gonna be plain out wrong, right? It just, that's not how computers actually work, okay? So uh, the model that we're gonna be based on is, I'm, I'm thinking of like the old 6502, the Motorola 6502s. Uh, again, when I was young, um, I was, uh, you know, in, in grade school and I was exposed to the Commodore 64. I learned basic programming and then I started learning how to do assembly language with the Motorola 6502. And my dad had a manual and in the back of the manual, there was a description of every single component on that computer. And this really helped me understand exactly what's going on. Now, modern computers do not behave anything like the 6502 does. However, the idea, the mental model we're gonna build up thinking of the Motorola 6502 is gonna help us build a correct model of what computers are actually doing. First, a little definition. What is a computer? So a computer is anything that computes. And back in the 1960s, a computer was actually a job. They would hire people to do computations and they'd put them in a room and they'd do all kinds of crazy computations. You know, each person would, they'd get like a couple numbers and have to add or multiply them or do something like that. And they'd hand a piece of paper to the person next to them. But a computer is a physical device that does computation. And this exists today. Um, probably the most common one that you carry with you at all times is your smartphone. Now, smartphones are computers. Uh, they behave quite a bit different than traditional computers, but they're still computers. If you have a smart watch as well, like the, um, uh, the watches that Apple sells, those are actually computers. They're very weak and very small computers compared to the old 6502s, they're very powerful. Um, then we also, if we go up the chain, we might have a laptop, right? Or you might have a PC desktop or some kind of desktop computer. And these are also computers. These are obviously computers. Most, most my kids, they get confused because they think when I say computer, I'm only meaning this thing. No, I mean any computing device. And of course you have your gaming consoles. Those are also computers. And there's lots more, right? Inside your car, there's a computer. Medical devices have computers. Your bank has uh, your the automatic teller machine. The ATM is a computer. Uh, grocery stores, when you check out your grocery store, your groceries are scanned and there's a computer that reads that in and adds up the totals. There's computers literally everywhere nowadays. All right, so the simple model of a computer is gonna work like this. So we have what's called a CPU, okay? And that stands for Central Processing Unit. It is a chip, okay? So some factory some time ago took a crystal of silicon, they sliced it, they printed onto it certain patterns, then they cut that into little square rectangular dies, and then they put that inside of a little plastic box with little legs that poke out, and then they stuck that onto a board. And that, that thing that's stuck on the board is called the CPU. And if you go, if you wanna build your own PC desktop, you're gonna go buy a CPU from AMD or Intel. I don't think there's any other manufacturers of CPUs out there for consumers, but there's a central processing unit. Now, nowadays, the central processing units are very complex. Um, there's always more than one. I, I can't think of any computers except the most simplest that only have single processes. And the CPUs, um, they're very fast. They operate, I'm, I'm, we're just gonna say that they operate at the gigahertz range. Okay, and what that means is that they do a billion operations per second. Okay, it's a very large number and it's very fast. Um, 
you can get ones that do more operations per second. The truth is, is with the optimizations these CPUs have nowadays, they're doing much more than a billion operations per second. Uh, then you have over here, you have the memory. And this is gonna include the RAM. RAM stands for random access memory. And this is, I'll just write random access memory. Okay. And the random access memory is another chip or set of chips, which you can tell them to store a value and to retrieve a value. And you store and retrieve those values based on their addresses. And the address is just a number. So like if your RAM chip has, you know, two gigabytes of data, then you can ask for the memory at location zero all the way up to location to two billion. And it will tell you what is at that location. You can also store memory inside of there. The problem with RAM is once you turn the computer off, it's completely wiped. Now, nowadays we have a uh, flash technology, which your smartphone and smartwatch probably have inside of it. Uh, this, the flash technology is basically RAM that doesn't disappear when you turn off the power. It, with a very, I think it's a very low current draw. It can keep the memory in memory without being wiped. And so your smartphone can actually shut completely down except for the flash. And then when it starts up again, it, it has the memory there. It, the, and I'm talking like low current draw, meaning like very, very tiny amounts of current. I don't think you need batteries. Anyway, I'm not entirely certain about how the technology works, but I, I do know that your USB thumb drives are a type of flash drive, I think. And they don't require power except when you plug them in. I do believe if you took a USB drive out and let it sit for like 10 years, it would probably wipe its memory just because it does need a tiny amount of charge. And there's, I think there's like a little capacitor in there or something like that that provides that charge. Anyway, there's also the hard drives, HD, or nowadays we have SSDs, solid state drives. And um, so the solid state drives and hard drives, they don't get wiped when you turn off the computer. So they can store not just large amounts of memory, huge files, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, but they do it very cheaply. And uh, they're not very fast, they're quite slow. Let me pull up the numbers here that I had. So I did a little bit of calculations and it looks like that these RAM, they run at about the 200 megahertz range, right? And then the, uh, the hard drives are running much slower than that. They're running, I think at like the four mega, is, is, it can't be right. I think like, I'm gonna say 10 megahertz range, right? So there's a huge order of difference in how fast these things are running. So you can do like five, 10 operations for every bit of memory you're able to retrieve. And then over here, you're able to do like a thousand operations for every bit of memory you're able to retrieve. So there's a lot of optimizations in order to get these things into the processor unit so it can actually do something with it. And then we have, on the other side, we have IO devices. These are things like your monitor. That's the display, the TV that you're connected to to show what is happening inside of the computer. And you might have a keyboard or a touch screen like your phone. There's a mouse maybe that's attached. You might have speakers with a microphone maybe and a camera. Then of course you have your network which could be ethernet cable or Wi-Fi and all kinds of things. So typically the technology we use nowadays is USB, but there's also Bluetooth and other things like that. Okay. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about what the CPU is doing. Okay. So the CPU has something called a PC, a program counter. Okay. And the PC is basically pointing at a location in memory. And it tells the CPU that that's the next instruction to run. And so the CPU looks at that location in memory. It runs that command. And the commands are basically one of several types. So the commands might be called instructions. And they could be something like load into registers. They can be store from the register into memory. So basically take memory, put it into a register, or store the register. And then there might be some kind of math op that you run between the registers, like add, subtract, multiply, divide, and stuff like that. Um, there might also be some kind of branching 
operation that says if these two values compare, then jump over there, and then you're gonna have some basic go-to functionality. So you can move the PC wherever you want. Typically, the program counter just advances to the next instruction as it goes along. And so these things together, these operations, allow us to build a Turing complete system. And what that means is you can basically write any program that does anything. There is no limit to the possibilities. And um, never underestimate, even simple programs are very difficult to analyze and understand. So we typically have to run the programs to see if they're doing what we expect and see how they behave. All right, uh, memory, we have, um, the way the memory and the CPU are connected is there's a bunch of wires that directly connect the memory to the CPU and they call that a bus. And the way the bus works is either the CPU or the memory will activate the bus and then the other components will either go into listen mode or they'll be activated when, when that other operation is done. And there's like a clock that keeps everything synchronized so they're not trying to talk over each other. Uh, hard drives uh, use also a, a similar but different kind of bus to communicate. Uh, typically what the hard drive and SSDs do is they load the data into memory and then once it's in memory, the central processing unit can operate on it. So you're gonna be, um, there's basically a, a cache that goes on here. And over here in the CPU, modern times, they have like an L1, L2 cache that can also cache the memory, right? And the way the IO devices work is this is more of a streaming operation. Okay, the memory is random access. I can say to the computer, I want to load an arbitrary section of the hard drive or I want to load an arbitrary section of the memory into the CPU and do something with it, right? I don't have to read it in order. Now, obviously with hard drives and the spinning platters, if you read it in a particular order, it'll be faster. But SSDs, that's no longer true. SSDs behave exactly like RAM, random access memory. The I.O. devices, however, are quite a bit different, right? It doesn't make any sense to ask the keyboard what key was being pressed a minute ago. It doesn't know. It just knows what's happening right now. And so what happens is these will either generate input into the computer, and the input appears as a series of messages on a stream. The message is saying, hey, something happened, or something no longer happens, or it's beginning, or it's ending. And the input typically writes to a location in the memory directly, okay? And then if you have something you wanna show the rest of the world, that's the output. And so like your, if on your graphics card, you have a section of the memory that's reserved for the actual image that's to be shown, and there's a device or some series of chips that'll actually translate that section of memory to a signal that can go out to the monitor show up on the screen. And so you have this input stream, you have output streams. And this is a great abstraction for understanding how IO works. And, and you know, we're, we'll, I, I don't know that we'll spend a lot of time talking about the different ways to do IO in Python. It's very heavily dependent on the framework you're using, not necessarily the language you're using. So it's, it's more the realm of, like if you decide to use Unity to write a program, right, write a game or something like that, it has its own way of handling these kind of things. So I'm not gonna talk too much about Python about this, but we will talk a lot about dealing with streams of data, which is quite common. All right, so that is a brief overview of what a computer is and how it works. Um, what do programmers actually do? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take and build a series of instructions that we want to run on the CPU. And we're gonna store those typically on the hard drive eventually, right? We might store it over the network so it comes in as input in the memory and then it's written to the hard drive as a cache or something like that. And then it gets loaded into the RAM. And then once it's in the RAM, the central processing unit can operate on that piece of memory, that piece of program that we wrote, that we stored in memory. Uh, in addition to that, with, that's the instructions for how the code is supposed to work. We're gonna have to have the job of organizing the memory in the RAM uh, into what we call a data structure, right? So we're gonna take the data and we're gonna structure that. And there's, we're gonna talk a lot about data structures, about how to organize and store data and how to access data. So that's basically job number one of Python is, is allowing you to organize the data and allowing you to access it. Um, and of course, we also worry about whether the input devices are treated properly or whether we're doing the right behavior on the input and right behavior on the output. One more thing I wanted to call out before I wrap this up is the importance of this IO device right here. For the vast majority of my career, I have only ever written programs that communicate over the network. Uh, only a handful of times have I ever written programs where we actually present to the user something for them to do other than talk to the network, okay? 
This is scary, but it's really not that hard. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the network. The network is the same for any operating system. Everybody uses BSD sockets. Um, everybody uses HTTP and TCP IP and SSL and TLS and all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna talk all about that and how to make that work. I think that'll probably be where I spend most of the time if we do focus on IO at all, on what to do with the network and how that works. All right, well, there's not much else to cover there. This is the basics of what a computer is. This is a simple model. Uh, obviously, there's lots of details in here that I'm skipping over, um, but this will give you a good framework to help you understand what to do as a programmer. And if you do wanna dive in to understand more about how these things actually work, then this is where you're gonna to wanna to go and look these things up. Uh, you can look up on Wikipedia and study about RAM, for instance, or CPUs. You can learn about modern flash technology, how it actually works. There's great Wikipedia articles on there. This isn't the focus of this series. This series is more focused on uh, developing software and the Python programming language. Guys, I hope you had a great time. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and click that like button and ring the bell to let uh, YouTube know and to help spread this channel. If you support my work, that's the great thing to do right now. So guys, take care and bye-bye. This video was part of a series on the theory of Python. You can click on the left to see the playlist and on the right to support my channel. Thank you very much for your time.